Welcome, adventurers, to the first ever session recap video from the Keister Chronicles. In this video, we're going to cover my most recent session with the Menagerie. The Menagerie is a group of heroes that I've been DMing for for the last 15 sessions, spanning the last eight months. Um, our heroes in this adventure are Dense, who is a warforged fighter. We have Bene, who is a tiefling bard. We have Pei, who is a lizard folk druid. And we have Basket, who is a tabaxi warlock of fast. They are level seven as this adventure begins. The session begins with our heroes already engaged in combat with the mercenaries who have been hired to guard the stronghold of a evil cult that claims to be the followers of Bast. Um, I, I know that's a lot to take in. We're just jumping right into the middle of things, so maybe I should rewind a little bit. And we'll start with a pig. So they had a pig. It's not important at this point why they have a pig. If they have a pig, the pig ran away. Again, not important why the pig ran away. What's important is that they chased that pig. And the pig was running through the streets of Arugala. Uh, a great bustling city uh, in the desert because that's where this campaign takes place is in a desert. We'll get to that too, but that seems like we're going back a lot now. So let's focus on this pig. So the pig is running through the, the streets of Arugala. They are tracking the pig and they track the pig into this blind alley. So it seems, as they're sneaking into the alley, that the pig is not the only thing that has been cornered in this alley. There's a tabaxi crouched at the end of the alley, and he's surrounded by men dressed in black, commoner's clothes, but black, dark, to disguise their motives, to disguise their motivations, to disguise who they are, and these men, as our heroes look on, fire a crossbow bolt, and it pierces the body of the tabaxi who falls to the ground. Our heroes rush in, eager to disrupt this dastardly deed in progress, and unfortunately they're too late. As they struggle with these bandits, the bandits begin to peel off one by one, and one of them yells, we'll come back for the boy later. But this wasn't a boy, this was a, this was a man, a full-grown tabaxi. As the leader turns to leave, he wants to make sure that this tabaxi is truly dead, and he reaches out with his long sword and decapitates the down form of the tabaxi. Our heroes rush in to try and do what they can, but it's too late. As the dust settles on the incident at the end of the alley, Pei, the lizard folk druid, is intent on finding their pig. That was the reason they came into the alley in the first place, and Pei, very single-minded, as lizard folk hunters tend to be, Pei more than most, Pei heads around the corner into the blind part of the alley, and as Bene and Basket search the body of the fallen tabaxi for clues as to his identity and why somebody would want to murder him, Pei sees the pig curled up in a bunch of broken crates, cuddling with a young tabaxi boy. Benny and Basket, in searching the body of the fallen tabaxi, find, tucked into a shirt pocket, a letter saying that he needs to get Marco, the young boy, away from his home. They need to take him and hide him. He can no longer, he's no longer safe at the Vaccaro estate. So Conte is asked to take Marco to go and stay with someone by the name of Milos. Milos owes a favor to someone named Giselle, who is the author of these letters. Now, Basket, as a tabaxi, has some knowledge of tabaxi lore. She works for traders, not in this area, but she has some recollection, and the name Vicaro rings a bell, and that bell rings gently in her ear and reveals to her that there is another Vicaro, a famous Vicaro, a famous dirgist, a bard, who is well known for singing songs of the dead and happens to hail from Arugala. They set off on a series of adventures through town and through exploration and information gathering, the party is able to determine that Giselle has gone missing. She left a note at an inn 
in hopes that Milos, once he had taken in um, this child, would deliver this message to her church, the Church of the Great Wave, um, and, and let them know what fate had befallen Giselle had, if she were not to return. Well, our heroes take matters into their own hands. When they return to Milos, Milos says he owes more than just the protection of this child to Giselle. He owes her his very life. The letter explains that Salamandre has an item. This artifact is an egg. Not your regular egg. It's a jeweled egg, a relic of a former age, a relic that he calls the Heart of Bast. And this artifact, this egg, can only be destroyed, Giselle has discovered, by a member of his own family, someone who is pure of heart. And in this research, she realized Salamandre also knows this. Marco is the only one who meets this description, and it's why he must be kept safe. This heart of Bast has corrupted him, has made him become one of the undead, and it is affecting all of those around him. And as he draws people to him, as he has created this cult, the Undying Song of Bast, he has created this lure that has drawn people to him with the promise that the music of the universe is an unending melody played by the cat god Bast, and that harnessing the power of this song, one can be granted life, youth, and happiness forever. It also so happens that Bast is the patron of Basket, the warlock patron, the elder god that uh, Basket uses to get her powers. Um, so this doesn't sit well. The idea that this god, this this religion that that Basket is trying to spread throughout the land as this great and wonderful thing is being used by this corrupted creature, this thing, this salamandre, to entice people to come and join a cult where unspeakable terrors are happening to them, where people disappear and don't return to their families. And so, our party discovers that this cult has a hideout down the river. So the party travels north, following the flow of the river. They know that about a day's travel to the north, they will come to a fork in the river, and they are to take the fork that goes down a narrow canyon. And midway down that narrow canyon, they will find a dwarven stronghold that Salamandre has sold his considerable fortune to take possession of, and he's using this as a recruiting center for new followers, new believers in his faith. And, as I said at the beginning of this video, they arrive on the beach, and beyond the beach, they can see a place where they can tie up their boats. They tie up their boat, and they head towards the two stone doors set into the side of the wall. The doors are emblazoned with globes wrapped in sheets of musical notes. There's arrow slits to the side, but they don't see any movement behind them, and they don't think that they'll be attacked. These, there are recruiting boats coming down here on an almost daily basis, just because they aren't part of that doesn't mean that they'll necessarily be attacked. They open the door to a room, a room lit by torches on all sides. Sitting in the center of the room, on a pedestal, is a golden lyre, strung with brass strings beautiful shimmering there. As they enter, two guards come from behind the lyre. They inquire what they're doing there. Bene steps forward and says that they've come. They heard of the greatness of the song undying, and they want to become a part of the cult. The guard smiles and says, but you must come back with a recruiter. I'm going to ask you to leave now. Go get in your boat, head on downstream, and return with a recruiting boat. There will be one coming soon. Bene sees the liar, steps forward as a bard, intrigued by this instrument. 
she picks it up and it begins to echo a loud discordant melody through the halls drawing the attention of other guards the two guards that are standing there before them draw their weapons you shouldn't have done that and battle begins and this is where we actually pick up this session in the middle of combat and our heroes vastly outpower the guards though the guards do outnumber them there's much bloodshed and pay grabs the liar he leaves his companions behind and rushes forward he sees a bridge crosses the bridge on the other side of the bridge is a door he begins knocking on the door let me in let me in there's invaders well hey is one of the invaders and the guards on the other side are not fooled they peer through and see a lizard man holding a liar the liar that is set up as an alarm and they banter back and forth for a moment as the combat rages behind Pei and keep the door locked. So Pei turns and joins his friends back in the fray in the in the room, casting powerful spells, disrupting the earth, causing the world to shake and the tide to turn even further in their favor. As this is happening, Basket takes a cue from Pei and runs to the other end of the of the bridge screaming we have invaders we have invaders i've got important news let me in and basket being a tabaxi one of the favored race of bast has that really going for her and manages to convince the guards to open the door the guards open the door and she rushes past she says i i have important news for salamandre and basket heads past them as the guards turn to close the door hey summons wolf spiders <laughs> Not regular wolf spiders, of course. This is Dungeons and Dragons. These wolf spiders are the size of large dogs. And it's kind of hard to close a door when you've got eight wolf spiders the size of large dogs in the way. So the guards in the previous room have either given up or fled. And the guards who let Basket pass are now smothered in spiders as pay dense and Bene are pressing in from one side. The guards are gesturing to Basket to go on, go, tell Salamandre we're being attacked. Get reinforcements. Basket turns and says, I'm with them. <laughs> Slipping a dagger between the ribs of the nearest guard. One of the guards does manage to slip past Basket though, raising an alarm. The alarm brings forth the true followers of Salamandre those who have truly been affected by the heart of Bast. It brings forth gentlemen of high esteem, dressed in finery. They come rushing to the aid of the hired mercenaries. And as they begin to enter into combat with Basket, the jaw unhinges on the closest one, and a long tongue lolls out, revealing pointed teeth terrible stench of death as it breathes. These are not just regular followers. These are ghouls, ghasts, men who have been touched by the egg. True followers, true believers of Salamandre and the Song Undying. But the Song Undying doesn't leave things unchanged. It has created for Salamandre an army of the undead. The army is small, right now, but the song and the idea of the cult and everything it stands for is so appealing to so many that it's only a matter of time before he has a true army. But for now, seven of these monstrosities come and engage in combat with our heroes. The heroes match them blow for blow. As the battle rages, Basket has the idea that maybe there's something further in this great complex, something further in that can help them. She goes rushing down the hallway, past a fount filled with clear water, into a room that opens out across another bridge, much like the one that they came to first. As she sneaks up to this bridge, she can see across the archway, the bow of the bridge, 
she can see the sparkling rainbow iridescence coming from a room on the other side and haunting music. She can see the form of a tabaxi dancing to the hollow voices of something inside. There's a sparkle of magic. There's something happening in that room. As she crouches down, she glances to the side. She sees a door, a door with a small window in it, a small barred window. This is the form of Giselle. She calls out, and Giselle says, Well, do you have a key? Basket says, Well, where would I have gotten a key? She said, Well, the guards have keys. Basket's like, Ah, I know where the guards are, and rushes away. As Basket rejoins the combat, she sees massive walls of fire everywhere. There are smoking corpses. She's not sure she's going to be able to find a key in all of this, and she can see there are even more undead moving the direction of her friends. She rushes back to the door, says, Giselle, stand back! And she casts magic into the lock, bursting it forth. And Giselle steps out and says, I need a weapon! Give me a weapon! And Basket, who is a warlock, hands her a dagger. Because that's what a paladin needs. A dagger. However, paladins are noble, and using this small device, rushes into combat. Luckily, it was the end of combat. She uh, threw around some healing to bolster the heroes and keep them on their feet long enough to vanquish the foes. And then she turns to the party and she says, well, where is my equipment? You must have run across, across my equipment. They're like, equipment? She rushes into the first room, where there is a chest, and in that chest is her sword, her armor, all of her equipment. Thus equipped, she is truly ready to do battle. The heroes are tired. They are spent, they have cast many spells, they have grievous wounds, and they say, can we just rest for a moment? And Giselle looks at Basket. She says, did you see what I saw? And Basket explains that in the room just across the bridge, there was magic going on, some sort of a ritual, something that, if left, could cause them even bigger problems. The party agrees that they should go and take care of whatever this issue is that is brewing on the other side of the bridge. But they don't want to just rush in. They need to have a plan. Uh, as Basket had described, there's a port close between them and the Bard, and with the party's spell capabilities greatly depleted, they don't want to get into a firefight through an iron grate with the Bard. So the plan is hatched for Pei to become a weasel and go and see what he can see on the other side of the bars while everybody else takes up positions where they can fight and cover any advance that might happen across the bridge. Well, hey, turns into a little furry weasel, slips through the bars and immediately spots, in addition to the dancing bard and four hollow voiced singers. Four creatures that are not as terrifying as the ones they just fought, but somehow more so in the fact that they just seem to be empty shells, again dressed in finery, dressed in the finest clothing that is available in Arugala. These four creatures look like people who have lost all hope, who've lost everything within them, and are just singing for the amusement of this tabaxi. This tabaxi dressed in red and white flowing robes with a mask of solid gold covering half of his face. Pei glances around and sees a lever in the wall near the, the portcullis and using his whole weight, leaps onto it, 
and pulls the lever, and the portcullis retracts into the ceiling. This is what the party at the other end of the bridge had been waiting for. Dense stepped out from where he was hiding on the other side of the bridge and fired an arrow straight at the dancing bard, followed by a second. The bard turned his attention to the party at the other end of the bridge, just in time to be met by a blast of a fireball that filled the room, incinerating the four singers. The bard stepped through just in time for the counterspell cast by Basket to wash over him, depleting the magical energies that had been stored within him from the ritual that he had been casting. He immediately shook his head, looked at the party, and said, Who will be my muse? And one by one, he tried to take over the minds and the bodies of the party. But our heroes, our hero's resolve was too strong. He failed time after time. He failed as he was trying to possess their mind, possess their body. He blasted them with every magic that he could think of. He stalled them out with hideous laughter, with irresistible dances. But the heroes blasted through again and were able to strike down the physical body of Salamandre. They weren't quite sure where the egg was though because it wasn't obvious as they got into the room. They saw rows of mindless drones prepared to sing for the amusement of Salamandre. Ones who were not quite powerful enough yet to join his army but he was working through them. They found a room full of papers, the studies that he had done in order to find what this thing was that he called the heart of Bast. He had found much research, and that is how he had found the weakness that he needed to dispose of Marco, as he was the only one who could truly end the heart that had latched itself to Salamandre. They found an empty box made of steel adorned on the outside and plush on the inside with a spot the size of an egg where the artifact may have been kept, but it wasn't there now. Dense thought, hey, this guy's undead. Maybe he stored it inside of himself and started cutting into the body. Luckily, nobody else was in the, in the area as the undead gases dissipated and dense, not having to breathe, immune to that sort of nonsense, made quick work of the body, tearing it into pieces and finding nothing on the inside. Then it occurred to him that the rainbow iridescence was still coming from the chandelier above. He walked into the room, looked around. Everybody else was off exploring elsewhere found a treasure trove in one of the rooms, and then the trove of knowledge in another. Looked up, looked over to where the uh, chandelier was tethered to the wall, pulled out his axe, and cleanly severed the cord holding the chandelier in place. The chandelier crashed to the ground, shattering, sending shards of crystal skittering across the floor, and what was left, untouched in the middle, was an egg adorned with jewels with a hinged lid. And that is where we ended the session. So, we'll see what happens next time when the party gets back together. Um, my plan is to make some other videos that kind of introduce you to the characters, do some more of the backstory of what they did um, prior to this adventure. But for now, we're gonna call this the first session recap, even though it's the 15th session that the party has been on. Um, but we'll call this the first session recap from the Keister Chronicles. If you want to see more content like this, if you want to continue to help me make this happen, to motivate me to do this, the link to my Patreon is in the description below. Uh, feel free to, to donate uh, to that if you found this enjoyable. If you want to check out any of the other things that I'm posting on my Patreon, there are levels for that as well. 